Uh, so today my colleague Maha and I are going to be presenting <coughs> a uh, parametric uh, daylight facade optimization that we recently developed uh, in our uh, professional practice at White. Um, the purpose of this uh, optimization is to inform the architects on some design boundaries uh, when dealing with uh, projects with a high expectations on performance uh, in, with uh, environmental certification systems. Um, how, how are we doing this? We're doing this uh, using a, uh, something called the Grasshopper. It's a um, graphical algorithm editor. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, it's some kind of like easy programming. Um, and we're using also two of its envir uh, environmental design plugins, Ladybug and Honeybee. So just, uh, I'm going to brief you um, a little bit about our company. So White is an em employee-owned company. Uh, with a strong focus on uh, sustainability and research and development. We're the third largest uh, architecture firm uh, in Europe. Uh, we have about we have 16 offices, most of them in Scandinavia. Uh, and we have uh, recently come up with three strategic development areas, two of which will be ad ad uh, addressed in this presentation today, uh, namely daylight, uh, parametric design and daylight. So uh, we work. We both work in a group called Digital Sustainable Design. Uh, we're, as its name indicates, we work with the integration of uh, digital tools and uh, sustainable design. We're, we're currently seven people, but uh, we're expanding our, our group quite quite a lot um, in the last times. So we have worked uh, with some parametric facade design in white architects in some some of our projects. Here you can see a project, for example. Uh, where you can see how the the window uh, size varies according to the its their distance to some attractor points in the facade, creating this gradient effect. Uh, but we wanted to take this a uh, step further and uh, combine the parametric facade facade design with some daylight optimization, that is using daylight as the uh, optimization parameter. Uh, so that we don't only have an aesthetic effect, we also have a purpose, a justification to the, to the gradient or the, the shape we're creating. So that's why we've created this methodology. Uh, we have applied it to two hospital buildings uh, as a pilot. These hospital buildings are located in, in, in Malmo, in the south of Sweden. And uh, from the beginning, the, the, two, the both hospitals ha uh, had a modular system in the facade. So we agreed with the architects that we would try to use this new uh, daylight optimization system to try to size the windows on each of the modules according to the daylight required in each of the rooms behind them. Um, so, yes, thanks. Um, so our experience with the pilot project was successful and from that we proceeded to create three documents to build up uh, a methodology from it um, and to standardize the use of tool at White. So we've built up uh, three documents. The first one is a tool assessment based on our experience in the pilot project and two other ones which are guidelines for the architects and for the digital sustainable design specialist. So uh, today I will uh, go through the pilot project and I will show you our experience with it. Um, and as Alejandro said, uh, it's co it consists of uh, two hospital buildings in southern Sweden. And that, uh, both buildings were required to comply with Milieu Big Not Gold, which is the highest level of the certification system um, in Sweden. Uh, so why uh, are we do were we doing this? Uh, the aim of this was to balance three aspects with conflicting interests, which was daylight, solar heat gains, and thermal losses. And this is especially important with buildings that uh, have high demand uh, with regard to the certification systems, where all of these three parameters um, have high demands in them. So how was this done? Uh, the methodology was divided into three parts. Phase one was to identify uh, the sufficiently daylit area. Um, and this is recommended in all projects now at White. And um, it's recommended to do it at an early stage to verify that there is enough daylit area in each floor plan. 
And phases two and three uh, were to identify the minimum window sizes and minimum shading sizes needed. And those ones are more applied to buildings where you have more strict requirements with regard to the certification system. So talking more about phase one, in phase one, as I've said, um, the aim is to identify the maximum floor area where you can get uh, daylight uh, to verify that all of the daylight spaces that have daylight requirements ha will, uh, will achieve uh, sufficient daylight levels. And uh, from, that, from there, we simulate using large, the largest window sizes in agreement with the architect. And uh, we simulate the maximum room depth inside the space. And I will illustrate this in this slide. So this is an example of the result, one of the results uh, for one of the floors in the hospital building that we got. And you can see in the image on the left side that um, the area that is highlighted by pink is the potentially daylit area that can be reached in this building. And also it shows the maximum room depth, so uh, how far you will receive daylight in the floor. Uh, in the sp in the floor plan and the 1% daylight factor contour line, which should be halfway between the maximum room depth and the main elevations of the building. And the image on the right uh, shows the preliminary daylight area that was suggested by the architect. So the intended um, areas uh, at the design phase that they wanted, and this is highlighted in light gray. <laughs> And you can see that there is a mismatch between the two images, which is uh, the non-compliant areas. And these areas do not receive, in this case, sufficient daylight, and then they will need to be relocated in other areas in the floor plan. So to summarize the results of phase one, uh, this graph is a summary of, all of the results of all the floor plans in the hospital building. And you can see that uh, in each floor plan, you have the maximum floor area, and then you have the areas that are required to comply, which is uh, divided into two parts, the area that is compl uh, compliant and the area that is non-compliant, highlighted by orange. And then the straight line is the area that was potentially compliant, which was the same one that we simulated here with this pink area. Um, so, and from this graph, we have three cases. The first case is in uh, floor zero, for example, where the areas that are required to comply is larger than the potentially compliant area. And this means that some of the spaces in this floor are not receiving enough daylight, and then they would have to be relocated in other floor plans that have um, higher potentially compliant areas, such as floor six or floor seven, for example. Another case is floor three, where you still have some areas that are non-compliant, but the total area that is required to comply is less than the potentially compliant, which means that there are some spaces in this floor plan that are not meeting the daylight requirements, but they can be re redistributed in the same floor plan. And the third and the last case is, for example, in floor six, where all the areas are required to comply, and then uh, you don't need to relocate any of the floor plans. So this information is given to the architect to help them in the design process to rearrange the spaces within the floor plan, each floor plan and within other floor plans as well. So uh, once the, we get rid of all the red areas, once we get, we make sure that all the areas in our floor plans can comply with daylight, we move on to uh, phases two and three, where we're supposed to set the minimum window size and the minimum shaded size required to comply correspondingly with the daylight and the summer thermal comfort requirements. First thing we do, we sit with the architects and we um, agree on the minimum window size and the maximum window size we can have and all the steps in between, like you can see in this uh, image. Um, then we are ready to run the um, the actual optimization. Uh, now I'm going to show you a video about this. Soon. <laughs> it's coming. 
There we go. So here you can see this is the optimization screen. It runs in iterations. The first iteration is uh, run with the maximum uh, window size. You can see here, this is the maximum ref room depth of, the, of our, of our uh, floor plan. We run the first DELA simulation, we get the results, the DELA factor align, in this case we've used 2%. And from, that re from, those, from these results we see which areas are over the daylight uh, level that we need, where they're higher than the, than the threshold that we need according to the Swedish requirement, and which are below. Uh, the Swedish code indic uh, indicates that the this uh, in this case it's 1.2 percent daylight factor needs to be uh, at at least at half room depth. So what the script is doing is progressively iteration after iteration uh, reducing the window sizes until the uh, the contour line the daylight factor contour lands exactly at half room depth. And this is going to be the uh, minimum window size you're going to need in each of your windows. So you can see, in this case, it took 16 um, iterations to get to the minimum. You can compare the first one and the last one. So this is how much the, the windows were reduced in this example. So uh, this is the, an image uh, with the actual results of one corner of one of the floors in one of the hospital buildings analyzed. Uh, here you can see from before, from phase one, you still have the maximum room depth that we run with full windows. This is the, the area that can potentially be uh, daylit according to the Swedish uh, regulation. Then, again, in a very light gray, you, can't, you can barely see it, but this is the, the actual uh, room depth that the architects designed with that information of, of the maximum room depth. And then, based on that room depth, we did the... Uh, facade optimization, and we, t we gave them the information on how big their windows have to be in each part of their facade. That is shown with these symbols here that uh, represent each of the modules on the facade. Uh, they have a, a magenta hatch that represents the minimum window size that uh, needs to, they need to have to comply with the DELA requirement. And they also have uh, these uh, green triangles showing the, the percentage of that uh, glass that, ne that needs to be shaded, in this case with an, with an external shade, to comply with the summer thermal comfort requirement of the Swedish uh, certification system. Um, just to clarify here, uh, I should not forget to mention that we're not designing for the architect, we're just setting the boundaries of their design. We're just telling them this is how deep you can go, this is how small you can go with your windows, this is how small you can go with your shading devices. So we're, we're setting up the boundaries. And this is a summary of the results um, per floor. You can see here uh, we have accumulated the total minimum window area that you need in each of the floors and the minimum uh, shading area that you need, represented by the uh, magenta bars and the, the red rectangles. So you can see approximately uh, and calculate with the energy engineer if, that's, if, if that would be okay with energy, uh, the, the minimum percentage you need for, for your daylight to, be, to comply with daylight. And this is the, the project as it is right now. We received this uh, rendering three days ago from our Malmo office. As you can see, it seems like they're following our, um, our optimization. They're having uh, bigger windows in the lower floors, at least that uh, I can see that, and uh, larger shading devices at the top floors. Thank you.